12 weeks for £12. Subscribe to The Spectator for this excellent deal and get a £20 Amazon voucher at www.spectator.co.uk forward slash voucher. Welcome to Holy Smoke, The Spectator's religion podcast. I'm Damien Thompson. My guest today is a member of a family that has, at various times, ruled Austria, Hungary, Spain, Portugal, the Netherlands, Burgundy, large parts of Italy, Croatia, Bosnia, southern Poland, and Mexico. You will have guessed from that that his surname can only be Habsburg, and it is. Edward Habsburg is Hungary's ambassador to the Holy See, and I know him, as do many people, through Twitter. Edward, whose family title is Archduke Edward of Austria, is also an unofficial online ambassador for his Catholic faith. His Twitter feed is more uplifting and funny than that of any bishop I can think of. He writes it, he says, to show the world that Catholics are not sad, prudish and world-fleeing weirdos. Well, at the moment I think the jury is out on that particular question, but he certainly proved that he isn't. I'm just looking at his tweets now, and I see that he's got a thread up on the growing beard of Franz Joseph. That's his great-great-grandfather, the Emperor Franz Joseph, which catalogues in paintings how the Emperor's whiskers gradually joined forces with his moustache. To culminate in, says Edward, a final stage in which Franz Joseph could stare down Jason Robards in Once Upon a Time in the West and there are pictures of the two men to prove the point. The cinematic reference is typical, though sadly the zombie movie that Edward wrote never went into production. He is, however, the author of two short books on James Bond and Harry Potter. Other running themes are, as you might expect, the spectacular success of the Hungarian government's family policy and his profound devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. On the Feast of the Assumption, he tweeted out, Honour Our Lady by going to Mass and, what do you say, praying a rosary? It's not that hard. Two smileys. You just need ten fingers. Anyway, it's no surprise that he has 27,000 followers, which I notice is a thousand more than me. I'm going to have to do something about that. We've only met a couple of times, but he's definitely somebody I count as a friend, not least because... As you may know, my sister Carmel, who's a brilliant occasional co-presenter of this podcast, has cancer, and Edward, although he's never met her, has prayed for her every single day for the last 18 months. I caught up with him earlier. The sound quality isn't great. It sounds a little bit as if it was recorded in some cavernous Habsburg palace, but he's never lived in one. I'm slightly kicking myself because it was only after I spoke to Edward that I looked at a fascinating Wikipedia article on the origins of the famous Habsburg jaw, which has an awful lot to do with what's diplomatically termed cousin into marriage. But let me assure you, he's a very handsome chap and doesn't have one. I mean, he has a jaw, but not a Habsburg jaw. Anyway, I began by raising a rather trivial point, which is I was brought up to call the family the Habsburgs with a P, but I gather that this is a terrible solecism. Well, that's a long discussion. I had it on Twitter all over. I've become very tolerant of the P in Habsburg because I've been told, after being angry about it for one or two years, that it is long time practice in the English language to spell it that way. In fact, very long. In fact, since the 16th century, more or less. And therefore, it's okay in the English-speaking world to spell Habsburg with a P, uh, on the continent, of course, we spell it with a B. And yes, Damien, I am one of that family, and to be precise, of the Hungarian branch of the Habsburgs, uh, which explains, of course, why I'm ambassador for Hungary. But if you really want to know exactly where I fit into the family tree, we can have a nice 20-minute conversation about it. Well, I think it would take more than 20 minutes, actually. I mean, just your own immediate family tree has Habsburgs on both sides, but the actual family tree of the Habsburg family, it just, it just does your head in. I mean, you ruled Austria from the 13th century to the 20th century and were Holy Roman emperors for much of that time. But when you lost that title, became emperors of Austria. And the first emperor of Austria in 1804 styled himself not just emperor of Austria, but king of Jerusalem, Hungary, Bohemia, Dalmatia, Croatia, 
Slavonia, Galicia and Lodomeria, Archduke of Austria, Duke of Lorraine, Salzburg, Würzburg, Franconia, Styria, Carinthia and Carniola, Grand Duke of Krakow, Grand Prince of Transylvania, Margrave of Moravia, Duke of Sandomir, Masovia, Lublin, Upper and Lower Silesia, Auschwitz and Zato, Teschen and Fiula, Prince of Berchtesgaden and Mergentheim, Princely Count of Habsburg, Goritzia and Gradisha and of the Tyrol, and Margrave, Margrave, love that, of Upper and Lower Lusatia and Istria. But that's not the whole of the story by any means, because an earlier branch of the Habsburgs had ruled Spain and Portugal and the Spanish Netherlands. And the Austrians later, very unhappily, got entangled in Mexico when an Archduke of Austria accepted the title of Emperor of Mexico and was executed there in 1867. And talking of executions, a Habsburg Archduchess was executed in France in 1793, by which time she had in fact become the French Queen Marie Antoinette. That's extremely well known, of course. Less well known, perhaps, is that the Habsburgs supplied a King of England, in name anyway, because when Philip of Spain famously married Queen Mary, he was given the title King of England, though wasn't monarch. But that didn't work out either. Anyway, obviously none of this is news to you, Edward, but I'm just pointing it out to illustrate the fact that the Habsburgs have been everywhere, and really, if you know the history of your family, that, that would be almost enough to get you a history degree, at least in the days before history was farmed out to Black Lives Matter. But it did all come to an end in 1918, or perhaps you could say in Sarajevo in 1914, when the assassination of a Habsburg triggered the First World War. But the family is still around, and there are still several branches, and I'm still a bit confused. So uh, if you could just help me with that. There is basically four. Uh, one of them is what I would call the Vienna branch. One of them is the Tuscany branch that descended from the Dukes of Tuscany, Habsburg. Then there is um, the Teschen branch, which are the descendants of um, Archduke Karl, the man who beat Napoleon in the first land battle that Napoleon lost. And the youngest branch is the Hungarian branch. And so you have four branches of the Habsburgs, and we are all together about three to four hundred people all over the world. We all know each other, we get along with each other, and are all in a WhatsApp group. A WhatsApp group for Habsburgs, that's, that's quite surreal. Yes. Most people think that we spend our time uh, opening and closing dusty books about family history, but we actually have arrived in 21st century. And we have a WhatsApp group, and uh, some local Habsburg family groups have their own WhatsApp group, so we are very much in modern times. And what do you talk about? We debate history. Um, we have one or two really good fam family historians. We usually share articles that came out about the family, so family members all over the world know what is being talked about in connection with our family and are able to answer to that too, which whenever, you know, a claim is put out somewhere on, in the world in an article on the internet, and we want to know, well, is that true? Is, is the First World War our fault? And all of that. And then births, deaths, pictures of babies, pictures of cute animals. And do you find yourself discussing the problem of bogus Habsburgs? Because... I don't know, for some reason, this is an area that's always fascinated me. It's quite funny, the phenomenon of bogus European aristocrats. It can be so difficult to tell whether somebody's real or not, because titles were granted all over the place by all sorts of different people. And there are lots of grey areas, whereas whatever you think of the British aristocracy, there really are no grey areas at all, because there's only one fount of honour who's the monarch. And so you can instantly discover whether somebody's entitled to a title or not. I can think of just one exception recently, which was when some horrendous chancer managed to acquire a knighthood from the Queen, but it was a knighthood in a former colony, in other words, a, a foreign country of which the Queen is head of state, and actually she didn't know that it had been granted. And in the end, Buckingham Palace and the Foreign Office and the College of Arms had to intervene to stop him using it, and then he was stripped of it anyway. But I would have thought that you know one of the things you might do on this Habsburg WhatsApp group is sort out the real thing from imposters. There are real Habsburgs, there are imposters, and then there are people where the situation is complicated. And um, as there were a few members in the last hundred years who sort of semi-disappeared or sort of took themselves out of circulation by disappearing into some country, 
it is absolutely possible that offspring of those turns up at some point. Sometimes that happens, but we really have covered more or less who belongs to the family. In our family, there are no different titles. Every single Habsburg follow the old title system is an archduke or an archduchess. Of course, if you're in Austria, you're not allowed to use that because there are no titles in Austria. But just to say, we all the same. This is a title we nasty people say invented several hundred years ago, each other a uh, fancy title. So it's a title that only exists in our family. And don't overestimate the, the glamour that you experience as a Habsburg. We're, we're not among the chic families of Europe. Really? Well, um, if the Habsburgs aren't, then who are the chic families of Europe? I won't answer you. I'm a diplomat. Damien, you can't ask me that. Well, fair enough. And as you say, you are a diplomat. You're Hungary's ambassador to the Holy See. And Hungary makes sense because you come from the Hungarian branch of the family. And not so long ago, members of your family spoke Hungarian as a first language. But it's not a job you expected to be doing, is it? It's a very unusual story because if you would have asked me two days before I was asked whether I could imagine to become ambassador, I would have told you, no way. I was a scriptwriter. I was a press officer for a bishop. I worked for television. I made a television series. I have actually written an outline for a zombie movie. So A zombie movie? Well, yes. I wanted to make a beautiful two-part zombie movie set in Austria. But then in the end, it didn't work out. So you see, I'm not your typical ambassador. And uh, I'm sorry, you're going to have to tell me more about this zombie movie. I'm fascinated. Oh, that, oh, that was lovely. It was supposed to, to depart with a group of young people in Vienna with a zombie outbreak. Then they would have to flee to the south of Austria, then into the mountains and survive. It was something like that, you know classical stuff. But of course, it never took off. But I was a script writer for a few years. I wrote two novels. I wrote several books. So, you know, my idea of diplomat was standing around at cocktails with a glass in your hand, smiling weakly, and not being allowed to say anything, not to cause any, any crisis, diplomatic crisis. That was my idea of a diplomat. So, it was the furthest possible away from what I could imagine ever being in my life. And then, of course, I was asked and uh, I've discovered that it's fantastic. It's absolutely fantastic to be a diplomat. And uh, I never enjoyed any job that much as I have enjoyed being a diplomat in the last years. And it was definitely the right posting for you, wasn't it? Because, well, you are very Catholic. Catholic faith was something that came absolutely normally to me through all our childhood. As you probably know, my brother is a priest. And uh, we were, yes, absolutely dripping in Catholicism from our childhood, but in a normal way, not in an oppressive way or in a, in a weird way. So when the Hungarian government asked me whether I wanted to be ambassador to the Holy See, and you realize they had thought about it, and I told them, look, my Hungarian is not really good. And they told me, well, you learn it, but the most important thing is you speak Italian and you have worked for the church. And they're right. I worked five years for a bishop. So I can speak church, so to speak. I know Catholic faith. I've been interested in Catholic topics all my life. I wrote my thesis in philosophy about Thomistic philosophy and the crisis of Thomism around the Second Vatican Council. So I think, you know, church papacy, Catholic faith was always on my radar. Actually, it's in my veins. So you can imagine that being ambassador here right now is like a child being locked in overnight in a chocolate factory. Well, I think it's that very upbeat attitude towards being a Catholic in very difficult times for the church that draws people to your Twitter feed. And also your, your very amusing take on being a Hasburg and all the centuries of history that come attached with it. And those two areas come together when you talk about or when you're asked about one particular person. An ancestor of yours who died as recently as 1922, who's been declared blessed by the church. And that is none other than the last Austro-Hungarian emperor. The Emperor Karl, who was only 34 when he died, in exile in Madura, because of course the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and indeed Habsburg rule, all seven, eight centuries of it, had come to an end in 1918. 
And no one could claim that Emperor Karl was one of the great Habsburg emperors because, in fact, he was only emperor of Austria and king of Hungary for less than two years. His ancient great-uncle, Franz Joseph, died in 1916 and because his heir, Franz Ferdinand, had been assassinated in Sarajevo, young Karl found himself catapulted into this lofty position and he tried to end the First World War and failed, obviously, and when it ended he was deposed post he tried to regain the throne of Hungary. That failed. There was a miserable exile in Madeira with his wife, Empress Sita, who didn't die until 1989. He caught pneumonia and it was all over. Or so it seemed, but in 2004, Pope John Paul II declared him Blessed Karl of Austria, recognising not only his personal saintliness, but his heroic attempts to end that terrible war. And, Edward, I know that you have a great devotion to him, and so do many members of your family. Well, I would say, what makes you a saint? You're a saint if you live your vocation in an extraordinary way, you live your work in an extraordinary way, you live your family life in an extraordinary way, and your personal relationship with God in an extraordinary way. And um, parenthesis, WhatsApp group. I made a little poll on our Habsburg WhatsApp group about two years ago. And I said, which are your favorite Habsburgs? So I asked all of them. Also the younger ones, the elder ones, everybody sort of chipped in. And the interesting result is that you wouldn't think the ones that most people would say, like Charles V or Empress Maria Theresia. No, Blessed Emperor Karl was first spot with a long distance the others. So apparently many of our young family members seem really to take him as an example. And he wasn't spectacular externally. He didn't look imposing. He wasn't such a rock externally like Francis Joseph was. He looked, he smiled a lot, he has his little mustache. You know, he didn't seem imposing. But when you enter the world of thought, of prayer, personal piety, of love to his wife, of incredible dedication to his wife, his children, his empire, his peoples, all of this, then you meet a giant. Then you meet a giant. And um, many of our family members feel that, you know, when you're married and you have children, you can look to Karl, the way he lived his marriage, the way he loved his wife, the way he was there for his children. The way he taught them faith together with his wife. When you're a Catholic, you can look at the way that he lived his life as a Catholic. For instance, he went to Mass every day, every single day. The only days he couldn't go was when he was on the transport ship to Madeira for a few days. And it was a nightmare because he and his wife both were used to going to Holy Mass every day. And they couldn't for a few days and it was very tough on them. And then you see how from the first day that he became emperor, he did everything to end the war at the point where of course it was already catastrophically far gone he did so because the pope encouraged him to do so and uh, he reached out to end the war and he did it even behind the back of the german generals and his own government in order to get an end to this war when he was in madeira and was dying he knew he was dying not only he called in his son to witness how an emperor dies Otto, Otto told me that, he remembered exactly, but uh, he also offered all his sufferings, and he had a really prolonged and suffering death for his people and for the countries. So even when he was totally weak and unable to fulfill his daily duties as an emperor, even from his deathbed, he tried to do something for the Austro-Hungarian Empire and for the people that lived there. So I think that's quite exemplary. So I think he's an example on every level, and we love him in the family. But sustaining that intensity of religious practice at a time when there's been a tremendous fragmentation of ideas about the supernatural and a general folding off of adherence to organised religion generally, that seems an impossible ideal, particularly in an era of digital technology. Uh, It's the $100 million question, isn't it? Uh, it's, it has become extremely difficult to lead a, a life centered around your faith. Um, I think you, you, you pointed out one of the, the, the key factors, in my opinion, is uh, internet and mobiles. You are distracted from, the, from switching on your phone while you're even half awake in the morning to 
switching it off last thing before you, after you switched off the light in your room. I'm, I'm overdoing it, but that's what you do. So you're entertained 20 hours out of 24. Entertained all the time. And I think our psyche hasn't been built for that kind of constant entertainment. Just 20 years or 30 years ago, there was no way to entertain yourself with videos while walking from A to B. Uh, you simply had to cope with, with, with having to look around and think or talk to somebody or reading a book and then being run over by, by a car at the next red light. But, um, so we are constantly distracted and entertained to death. And finding spaces to center your life on, on the principles of our faith in these circumstances is very difficult. It helps to have a wife and children. It helps to have children who take away your phone and say, no, daddy, no, you are now with us. Switch that thing off. Until, of course, they have their own phone, so they won't even notice you have yours on because they're on theirs. But um, this is a real problem, and I think it's very unhealthy for humankind, and it won't go away, and it will get even more entertaining over the next years. One, one very helpful thing is to pray without your mobile on. My, my family and me, we have a, a fixed date in the afternoon. We always pray a rosary together, and the mobiles are switched off. That's very helpful. Thank God, in summer, friends give us a place where we can stay. We don't have internet reception there. We don't have telephone there. So we are forced to make do with doing nothing, reading, talking, or playing. That's very useful. So taking times out from this incredible being amused to death is very important. Going to Mass, receiving your sacraments, going to confession. All of this can help to center your life. But I, I repeat, it has become far more difficult than even 15 years ago. And everybody has to see themselves how they do it. Well, I have to say, I never found it very easy, even in my definitely pre-digital childhood, when there was absolutely no danger of us amusing ourselves to death, as you put it. Though we did quite enjoy the two Ronnies on a Saturday night. Obviously, our two families didn't have that much in common. I mean, my father's imperial writ didn't run any further than the front garden of number 23 Whitleywood Road. But it was a very, very observant Catholic childhood, like yours. Mass every Sunday, sometimes on a Friday as well. And God knows how I ended up writing about religion for a living, because I, I didn't enjoy the church going or the praying. And there was only one attempt at a family rosary, and it was a disaster. We knelt awkwardly in front of the sofas, staring at each other. And, God, it makes my flesh creep to think about it, actually. The verdict afterwards delivered by my father was that um, one family member had spoiled it for everybody else. And from what I can remember, I'm sure I did, by yawning and sighing theatrically every time a new decade of the rosary started. But, actually, I think my father, who was really the quintessence of English reserve, might have been a bit embarrassed, even if I hadn't been misbehaving. Because you would remember this was the 1970s. And the rosary was part of a sort of ancient popular heritage of devotional practices that weren't exactly swept away by the Second Vatican Council in the way that the Tridentine Mass was until Pope Benedict restored it. But there was a lot of dismantling going on. And it was dismantling by the middle classes. It was a sort of dismantling of the devotions that meant so much to my grandparents, and which, as um, Stephen Bullivant in his brilliant book Mass Exodus shows, actually had a very destructive effect on the fabric of Catholic life. But by the time I was a teenager and my grandparents were either dead or very old, you were probably most likely to encounter the rosary as a communal activity. If you stumbled across the Legion of Mary, saying it together in church on, I don't know, Saturday morning. And I did stumble across it once. And I hope I'm not being rude when I say that, really, it was quite a noise. It was done very fast, in, in very pronounced Irish accents. Hail Mary, full of grace, Lord, with the blessed Holy Mary, Mother of God, with the Mary, full of grace. It seemed to get faster and faster, almost seemed to have a you know, competitive aspect to it. But actually, traditional religion very often is noisy. I mean, if you hear the psalms sung in Gaelic on the Isle of Lewis, it's quite a racket. 
I mean, like with shape note singing in America, and Hasidic synagogues are notoriously far, far noisier than reform ones. But in England, at least, I think it did rub up against this famous English embarrassment, which I think was more pronounced after the Second Vatican Council. And in God knows how many parishes there were these sort of modernising busybodies, these enlightened lay people who, I know for a fact, having talked to various priests, treated the Legion of Mary like parlour maids, which is probably how they regarded them. And I think we knew that it was still very important to the very small numbers of above-the-radar traditionalists, and also was still said in aristocratic houses, but number 23 wasn't an aristocratic house, and as I say, it was the embarrassment factor. The rosary seemed like a bit of an anachronism to many Catholics, but then so certainly did adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, and that has sprung back to life as a devotional practice. And likewise the rosary. So I'm not at all surprised to hear you talking about it with such enthusiasm and promoting it on Twitter. But although it's been recommended to me many times over the last few years, which you know haven't been easy ones for my family, oh God, the embarrassment factor is still there. So, I mean, any tips, Edward? Well, um, you could, for instance, sit together with your wonderful sister and try that. It's something lovely. But there is still the embarrassment factor, and maybe it's an English thing. I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen or saw in the pre-COVID era Anglicans who were unexpectedly asked to do the sign of peace at a service. I mean, they visibly want the earth to swallow them up. And this rosary would probably be happening in Carmel's kitchen. Damien, why don't you try to sitting back to back? Then you don't have to look into each other's faces while you pray. Well, I'll mention it to her, see what she says. But just briefly, what is so special about the rosary? What's so special about the rosary? Um, It is an incredibly humble thing to do. It is a repetitive thing. It is a nearly meditative thing. And you don't stand sort of face to face with God and discuss things out. But you bow under a rhythm and a repetition and something very simple. So saying the five decades of a rosary together, every child taking the lead, you know, for one decade, and uh, always, you know, including some special intentions with each one. doesn't take long, and but sort of lowers you into a rhythm that is healthy for the soul, I think. But as you say, it's something you learn by doing. If you do it the first time, you probably feel very weird. Um, if you repeatedly do it, then it, it gets easier, and it's part of Catholic culture since centuries. Well, obviously people who aren't Catholics probably won't feel tempted to say the rosary. And actually it's interesting that it was invented perhaps as early as the 4th century by the Eastern Orthodox Church, but they they don't say it anymore, probably because the Catholics do. But I think a lot of people will identify with your reference to a healthy rhythm, which ties in with what you were saying earlier about constant digital distraction. And I think for many religious believers, especially converts, faith, whatever faith, is a way of recovering a sense of rhythm, of coping with this awful uncertainty and disorientation that comes with the acceleration of change, social and technological disruption. The great thing about faith is that it can help you in difficult moments and can carry you. And uh, one of the things I like about Catholic Twitter is that uh, if you have lots of Twitter followers who are Catholic, you will run every morning when you check the latest tweets about some, across somebody who asks for prayer. And then you just say a little prayer for them. It's nice. And, and then you know if, I, if I'm in a crisis, if my things are in a bad way, I can ask others to pray for me. And uh, that's, that's nice. That's comforting. Well, it's almost as if you've helped create another dimension of Catholic Twitter, which can be incredibly toxic, I know, partly thanks to me. Lots of Catholics really do despise each other, thanks to the information they pick up on Twitter, which is often accurate information and the only place they're going to find it out. So it's morally rather complicated at times. But then you can turn to the at Edward Habsburg Twitter account and there's something different. It's funny and pious at the same time, which is an unusual combination. Wonderful combination. I'm worried I'm sounding a bit sycophantic, by the way, like a a Habsburg courtier. But I, I love it. And one of the reasons I love it is that I know from private conversations that you know what's really going on, why people's passions are so inflamed on both sides of various arguments. And that means that unlike all those dreadful bishops who take such pride in their contempt for 
social media and everybody on it, you're able to take the poison out of certain debates. It's a bit like Blessed Emperor Cal. You're trying to bring people together and to make peace if possible. And um, I'm totally aware of the Catholic Twitter wars going on, but I'm always trying to, you know, diplomat, build bridges and be nice with everybody. Well, Mr. Ambassador, Archduke Edward, there's a lot of stuff we could have talked about and perhaps will one day, such as Hungary's policies on the family and fighting the persecution of Christians, for which you're a very effective advocate. But it's been kind of fun letting the conversation roam. So, Edward, thank you very much. Get 12 weeks of The Spectator in print and online for just £12. And we'll give you a £20 Amazon gift voucher, absolutely free. Go to spectator.co.uk forward slash voucher.